Brothers and sisters, today I'm going to try and talk to you and share with you uh, some anecdotes from the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, the last few days have been very stressful and very trying. Uh, it began with what happened in Paris. Uh, different people have seen that particular event in different ways. They understand it in different ways. For some people, it was an act of barbarism, an act of intolerance. But to me, particularly, it was an act of betrayal by Muslims against the very teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You know, sometimes we, we find our American friends, uh, they wear these, these straps on their wrists called WWJD. I think you're familiar, what would Jesus do? And uh, sometimes it might help us to ask ourselves the question, what would Prophet Muhammad say when he saw us conduct ourselves in a particular way? One day a man came to the Prophet in the masjid and asked him, Ya Rasulullah, what is deen? What is religion? And the Prophet responded by saying, Akhlaq. Religion is akhlaq. The word akhlaq in Arabic implies good conduct, good behavior, good manners. Uh, for those of us who are from South Asia, we often use the word akhlaq to mean manners, good manners. Uh, but there is more to akhlaq than just good manners. It is also uh, the manner in which you conduct your affairs, whether they are ethically conducted or not whether they are conducted in a manner which are consistent with principles of justice and equality and good for all. So this man asks Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, what is deen? And he responds by saying, Akhlaq. He was an interesting man. So he goes on the right side of the Prophet ﷺ and says, Ya Rasulullah, what is deen? And the Prophet ﷺ responds by saying, Akhlaq. He comes in the front and says, Ya Rasulullah, what is deen? And the Prophet says, Akhlaq. He goes on the left side and asks the same question. Uh, ya Rasulullah, what is deen? And the Prophet says, Akhlaq. Then he goes behind the Prophet and asks the same question. I've read this tradition several times. I have not understood why he did that. He went again behind the Prophet and asked him the same question. Ya Rasulullah, what is deen? And the Prophet said, Akhlaq. And then turned to him and said, And not getting angry is Akhlaq. That is the only thing he added. He thought that perhaps the man was angry with him, because perhaps he was looking for a different answer. And when he got the same answer again and again, the Prophet said, And not getting angry is Akhlaq. So I find this, these, these two simple answers so profoundly beautiful in telling that our deen is akhlaq and akhlaq is not getting angry. And in these entire discussions in the last two days or three days that we have been having in the wake of the attacks in Paris, not many people have raised this issue. Uh, I've been doing media the last three, four days. In fact, all day today I was either on radio or on television. And in one interesting conversation, I was talking to the ulama from Pakistan. And nobody, I mean, they, they are angry, understandably. There is justification of anger, and to some extent also the justification of actions that have taken place, especially because of the the republication or the new cover of the magazine of Charlie Hebdo, which also published another cartoon of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It raises a lot of interesting issues. Regardless of what other people do, it is their akhlaq. What others do is their akhlaq, it is their ethics, their manners. If we respond in the same way as others do, then what really happens is, for example, if someone is rude to us and we are rude in return, if someone gets violent with us and we respond in a violent fashion, 
then what we do is that we concede our morality, we concede our akhlaq, we concede the ethical paradigm that judges our actions to the choices that our enemy makes or the other side makes. So if what we do is dictated by the choices that the other who is engaged in some kind of conflictual relationship with us, then it is perhaps the greatest of our tragedies. We have lost the battle before the battle has begun. What is the point of fight, fighting for values? What is the point for struggling for values? If we have already conceded our values before the struggle has begun, and our position is that we will respond according to the ethical values and choices that you respond. This is the only time there is a test. If life is a test of how we inculcate our values in our practices, then moments of crisis are the test, the bigger test. This is when we have to show what Islamic values are and not tell what Islamic values are. It's like saying you catch somebody by their collar and are twisting their neck and shouting at them and saying anger is haram. Now that is the question and that is the thought I want to convey to us that perhaps as Muslim one of the most important tasks that we have to perform is to manifest the values and the teachings of our dear Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If our conduct reflects this conduct, then there is nothing more needed to say. If we are honest in our interactions, if the manner in which we discuss the debate and conduct ourselves is impeccable, then we do not need to preach. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said something very interesting. He says that every ummah has a specific characteristic and every prophet has a specific mission. Now what he was trying to say in the hadith according to scholars who have interpreted it and written is that, that while all prophets have preached the same message that indeed there is one God that indeed he created all of us and he has sent messengers to us periodically to all nations and to all tribes to speak to us and remind us of the day of judgment the day on which he will hold us accountable to how we conduct ourselves in this world and then he will reward or punish us or forgive us it's the same message that every prophet has brought but while the broad message is the same, every prophet has one particular special message. And he said, my speciality of my message is the perfection of human akhlaq. He said, my mission is to perfect human conduct. He said this in many other traditions. Kataba Allahu ala kulli Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered that we conduct all affairs in a very beautiful way. Even if you slaughter an animal, you slaughter the animal in a beautiful way with a sand. So the Prophet ﷺ has repeatedly told us that his mission has been to perfect our human conduct. Now if you understand perfecting akhlaq as just perfecting manners itself, and if you notice that in Muslim societies, especially in high culture, there are very elaborate manners in which we interact with each other. Uh, when I travel to the Middle East the first time, uh, I'm constantly surprised as to how many times in a meeting uh, your host will send blessings on you, ask you about your family. He will ask you about everybody in your family will offer the best that is there in their home to you. Hospitality is such an incredible part of Muslim culture. All of these come from the prophetic teachings of perfecting our akhlaq, perfecting our mannerisms.
When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna Allah ya'amunu bil adli wal hasan, He says, I have ordered you ihsan with justice. What he tells us very clearly is that even a just conduct is not enough. This is very important. If we are the bearers of the final testament of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran, if we are the carriers of the final message of deen, if there is no more prophet coming after prophet Muhammad, this is it, then this has to be the best message and it has to be manifested in the best possible way. Even when we pursue justice, we have to do it in a beautiful way. The Prophet's cousin and son-in-law and the last, the fourth Caliph, Ali radiallahu anhu said something very interesting. He said, it is better to lose while being just than to win by being unjust. There are a couple of variations of this comment. In one instance he says, it is better to lose while being just than win while being unjust. Or it is better to lose if there is fear that we might do injustice if we win. Now, what are these teachings teaching us? What they are teaching us is that war, and one man came to them and started cursing and slandering Abu Bakr right in front of them. He was literally shouting at Abu Bakr, calling him names and slandering him. And Abu Bakr did not respond. He kept very quiet. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, also just sat there and they both listened to this man. And the man ended it, his diatribe, his emotion. But because he got no response, I think he was not satisfied. He unleashed another volley of abuse and slander on Abu Bakr. Again, he started shouting at Abu Bakr and saying, you are Fulan, you are Fulan, you are Fulan. No response. And then again, he was obviously not very satisfied. And so he started a third time to shout and slander Abu Bakr. And when he did this a third time, Abu Bakr responded to him and said, this is what you are telling is not true. The allegations that you are making against me are false. And he started responding to him. And as soon as Abu Bakr started responding to this man, Rasulullah got up and left. He just walked away from that gathering. After his conversation was over, Abu Bakr went back to the Prophet and said, what happened, Ya Rasulullah? Did I do something wrong? Were you upset with me? And the Prophet ﷺ responded by saying, he said, when that man was shouting at you and slandering you, I saw angels descend from heaven and they were defending you. When he slandered you, angels said, you slander. When he lied about you, angels were saying, you lie. But yeah, Abu Bakr, when you responded, when you started responding to the man, I saw the angels disappear and I saw Satan coming towards us. And when I saw Satan coming, I walked away. I did not want to be there where Satan was. It's a profound, profound tradition. I found it so moving when I read it the first time. Because we are talking about here that if after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, if there is any person that we are, we should emulate and follow and learn from is Abu Bakr. He, he, Abu Bakr Siddiq, he, he was the truthful one, the honest one. He is, it is his character, it is his personality that we would like to emulate. He is our first leader after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was Khalifa to Rasulullah the successor to the Prophet, the first success. And even when he was responding in a manner which was justified, he was responding in a fashion 
which is appropriate. There is nothing wrong with defending yourself. There is nothing wrong with correcting the slander that is thrown at you. Even then, according to this tradition, the, the metaphor or the significance of Satan coming to us that implies that now we have opened the door for satanic possibilities. It doesn't mean that Satan had taken over that event. What it means that Satan is coming implies that we have now opened the door for satanic possibilities. Now that is really very profound. I, I'm sure all of you have done it. But if you have not done it, go back home tonight and read the 42 ahadiths that were collected by Imam Nawabi. I think it's number 32 in which the Prophet says, La darar wa la darar. Do not do harm. Do not respond to harm. Imam Nawabi's collection, there are lots of people who have collected 40 ahadiths. It's a weak hadith which says that he who has collected 40 traditions will be forgiven, etc. So a lot of people have collected 40 hadiths. And I collect the collections of other people's 40 hadiths. So I have re read many of these collections, including by Shah Waliullah, Imam Suyuti, etc. And I can tell you honestly that there is no doubt that Imam Nav is, is the most profoundest and most thoughtful collection. And he said that these 42 traditions summarize the deen of Islam. That is why they are very important. There are people who collect 42 hadiths about knowledge. There are those who collect 40 hadiths about jihad and so on and so forth. But this Imam Nawabi is actually there are 42 in that collection. And in that he has this tradition which says, the Prophet says, do not do harm and do not respond to harm. Now, Imagine the, the amount of sabr, the amount of patience you have to have. I can tell you, it is very easy for me to sit here and tell you these things, but it is very difficult to live it. Just a few days ago I was playing tennis and the match ended. And at the end of the match, the brother on the other side who lost was a little frustrated, so he tossed the balls. Now this is an indoor court, the balls are not going anywhere. And they are on his side of the court, and as we left the court, that thing kept bugging me, that it is against the akhlaq of the club to leave used balls lying around. It is our job that we played, we take the used balls and either go home or throw them into the trash. But it is also the protocol and the akhlaq of the clubs that you take care of the balls on your side of the court. So I had picked up the ones which were on my side and this brother. And believe it or not, as I was walking away, I was upset that he had not done his job. And then as I went further away, I kept thinking about this whole concept of ahsan. And I said, how can I preach these things if I don't act upon it? And this is such a small thing. So I actually went back and picked the ball from that cord and tossed it into the garbage can and went away. It's a little thing, but it was so difficult. I actually had to struggle with my nafs in order to turn around and walk another hundred feet. Yes, we were tired and all of that, but still. So the, the reason why I'm sharing this anecdote with you is to say that even in such trivial matters, it is so difficult to go over and above or beyond what is the duty what you're expected to do to go over and beyond that is ahsan and to go over and beyond that is so difficult and that is the best way to summarize and underscore the life of Prophet Muhammad that he went over and above and beyond this he used to stand up all night and pray and he told his companions that this is not obligatory on you that's why he often prayed at home and not in the mosque because he didn't want his companions to see him and follow him. One day a companion asked him and said, Ya Rasulullah, why do you pray so much? Your feet are solemn. You're standing up all night. If you are not forgiven, then who can be forgiven? Right? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to forgive Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and send him to heaven, then who among us in this creation is worthy of that? 
Surely you at least, at least you are forgiven. So why do you need to pray so much for his forgiveness and for his mercy and for his compassion? And the Prophet ﷺ replied in a very beautiful way. He said, look, if that is true, that I am forgiven, then shouldn't I be a grateful slave to my Lord? So A, he's seeking forgiveness every night. Every night, staying up late and praying. But number two, he's also saying that even if I know that I will be forgiven, then shouldn't I be grateful to him because he is going to forgive me? Either way, he's committed to this extraordinary commitment to worship and ibadah. That is the kind of prophet we are lucky to belong to his ummah. It is about not responding to harm, not doing injustice. Even when we pursue justice, we do it with beauty, with ihsan. Throughout, since the day Prophet Muhammad Wasallam started and declared himself as messenger of God, since that day till this day, he has been slandered, he has been attacked. People have waged verbal and physical campaigns against him. But we all know, and history is witness to that, that of all religious people, he was the most successful in his mission in his lifetime and afterwards. In spite of all the anti-Islamic stuff that you hear every day, Islam is the fastest growing religion in every continent on this planet. There is no place where there is no Islam, and there is no place where Islam is not growing, alhamdulillah. Even in societies where on a daily basis, Islam, Islamic values, Islamic beliefs, the holy book of Islam, the Quran and the Prophet are maligned and slandered, Islam is growing. It is not because of something we do. Sometimes I keep wondering that Islam seems to be doing well by itself. Doesn't need us. The less we do, the better it is perhaps. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that he will protect his message. He has said to the Prophet, we have heightened and increased your mention and your remembrance. There is nobody in the whole universe who is as revered, as respected, and as loved by so many as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Is there anybody whose name is invoked with such respect? The word Muhammad itself means one who has been praised much. Is there anybody who has been praised more? Any human being? Not really. In the last 100, 150 years, we are living in a world which is becoming more and more globalized. What it really means by becoming more and more globalized is that there is nothing that we can do anywhere which is not available for the rest of the world. I don't know how many people are there in the masjid today. This is a small masjid, small state, small city. And we are doing, thanks to these cameras, this is globalized. If somebody in Australia, somebody in India, somebody in Alaska wants to watch it, they can. So in the last 100 years or so, the world has become more and more globalized, especially because of new information technology. And one of the things that has been going on is the maligning of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So those who are from the subcontinent, especially from Pakistan, will remember that as 100 years ago in 1919, an article was published uh, called Rangila Rasul in Pakistan, in Lahore at that time, British India. And it led to riots. And one young man who came to Lahore, the city, for the first time, and he saw all this hoopla going on in the city, he said, what happened? This was an 18 or 19-year-old kid. 
and they said that somebody had published an article in the newspaper attacking Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and that young man went and killed the writer. He went to the publisher's house, found out where the author was, and killed the author. It's, nobody seems to learn anything. Neither the Muslim culture learned the fact that this is not how Prophet Muhammad would have conducted himself, and neither have those who provoke such actions learned that this is not a wise thing to do. And it has been going on. But if you go back in history, we find that these things are going on. Our job is not to defend these things. Our job is not to defend Islam. Our job is to practice Islam. And the worst thing that we can do is to violate the principles and ethics of Islam in the defense of Islam. That is perhaps the worst thing that you can do is, it's like drinking alcohol to save your fast. Can you see the irony and contradiction in it? And you say, oh, I'm going to save my fast, and so I'm going to have a bottle of alcohol. It's like that, to break Islamic values and principles and betray them in the defense of the faith is perhaps one of the most ironic things that we can do. But the reason why I brought up this 100-year story of this is that with the colonialism, with a lot of Western powers taking over the Muslim world, a lot of missionaries came to the Muslim world. I don't know whether you have ever been confronted by a by Christian missionaries. Uh, I have on a few occasions and I found the strategy that they employ very interesting. They, they pitch Prophet Isa against Prophet Muhammad. These be upon both of them and say, what can Prophet Muhammad do for you? Jesus has already saved you. So I normally replied by saying, look, I'm in a win-win situation. If Jesus has already saved me, I'm already saved. And I also have Prophet Muhammad whom I can follow. But what is interesting is that if as a strategy, as a part of this interfaith competition, one of the strategies employed is attacking Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the way Prophet Muhammad has been attacked, in the past it was by rejecting him and saying he is heretical. He's just stolen some aspects of Christianity and Judaism and has cooked up and Nauzubillah created his own religion. That never worked. So the new strategy of attacking Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is through his life. Now what had happened in the Muslim world, which before this age of globalization, before the second encounter with Europe and its colonial experience, Muslims were living in peace and relative isolation. So they were living in Muslim empires, pretty safe, protected and Islamic religion, Islamic values and culture was thriving everywhere. So in this cultural milieu, Muslims more on the Prophet's mystical aspects, miracles of prophets. So people started talking about miracles of the Prophet, the mystical things he did. And slowly the Muslim world became less and less aware about the actual real history of Prophet Muhammad. So when this new Islamophobia came to the Muslim world, it came with specific questions about the life of Prophet Muhammad. What do you have to say about your Prophet who had many wives? What do you have to say about your Prophet Muhammad who did not advocate non-violence? And so on and so forth. So a particular episode from the history and sira of the Prophet would be taken and that would be attacked. Now that is a much more powerful attack and Muslims didn't know how to respond to that. And even today, even though we are living as highly educated populations in Western societies, Muslims are unable to combat with this knowledge-based attack on the personality and character of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon The only the first step to even coping with this reality, even if we do not wish to respond to these attacks, is to actually know your prophet. 
It is very important for us to read. I really, really encourage all of you here to read the biography of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Those who are young men and women born and brought up here, read Tariq Ramadans in the footsteps of Prophet Muhammad. It has been written for Western Muslims in a very simple, accessible language. Those of you who are capable of dealing with complex literature, you can read Qadi Ayyad's biography of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It is available in many languages now. Ibn Hisham's seerah of the Prophet Ibn Qasir's seerah, they're all available. And some of them are available free. Just type that with a PDF in Google and they will pop up. But read up and know your Prophet. The Prophet said, your faith is not complete until you love me more than your wealth, more than your family, more than anything in this world. How can your love be based on ignorance? How can you not know the person that you love more than yourself? And that is very important, especially for Muslims who live in the West. We have to learn two things. Uh, I'll speak for one more minute and then I, I'll be happy to take any questions. Look at the Prophet's life in Mecca, when he lived as a small religious minority living in a society which rejects his faith, oppresses him. Look at the akhlaq, look at his conduct. How did he respond? That is an important message to Muslims who live as minorities in Western societies today. How did Prophet ﷺ deal with the oppression while he lived in Mecca? For Muslim countries today, the example of Prophet ﷺ in his last 10 years in Medina is a very good example. When he was a sort of king or president of a proper nation, the community in Medina had developed to become a political community in Ummah. We have his example in front of him, how to conduct ourselves, what should be our akhlaq when we are a minority in, with no power, how should we be when we are in power and we are in majority. Now both these principles are there and we can only act upon them if we learn about the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Jazakallah khair. I hope that these, these tragic events, inshallah, will become motivators for all of us to know more about our Prophet to, more, to learn more about his life, to learn more about the values that he valued and to try to inculcate in ourselves, in our behavior, in our conduct, the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Jazakallah khair. I'm done. If people have questions, I'll be happy to take. Otherwise, Question I'll... and answers? I have a question. Isn't it like unfortunate that for some reason uh, we were being not able to preserve the biography of Prophet Muhammad in a very uh, authentic manner because most of the biographies referred to Ibn Ishaq or Ibn Ishaq and they have quoted. The thing is that in Islamic masadir or sources, we have this hierarchy of sources. We have the Qur'an, the Hadith literature, and then we have the Seerah literature. The Qur'an, alhamdulillah, is the most and perfectly authentic text. That is our belief. That every word in the Qur'an is the word of God. It is authentic, no contest about it. And then we have the Hadith literature. Now about the Hadith literature itself, it varies from, by different counts, up to 30,000 Hadith. Some say even 70,000 Hadith. But at least among the Sunni community, we agree that, we, that there are probably 4,400 Sahih Hadith from Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, and we have the six Sitta Sahih of the Sunni. Uh, so when you look at the complexity of the Hadith literature, we classify them as Sahih Hadith, authentic, or Hassan, which is good, or Daif, which is weak, or Maudu, which is manufactured, or false. So in our literature, we also have traditions which are fabricated. But there is a science of hadith, of, of identifying which is a correct and which is, which is strong and which is a weak tradition and so on and so forth. 
But the Sira literature, unfortunately, is not that strongly done. So if you read Ibn Ishaq's uh, Sira of Prophet Muhammad, he has done a very good job of footnoting controversial issues. It is very interesting that when you read, the quality of work goes up and down, up and down. Like, the isnads are weak, sometimes there are no isnads in the reports for several things. And then when you focus on one specific thing, sometimes which are controversial issues, you see he's really footnoting it very well with lots of tight control on the isnad and who's saying what and providing a total picture. And so it tells you that he was aware of the importance of being rigorous in the scholarship. Unfortunately, the Sira literature. And the reason why this question is important and I'm taking so long to answer is that some of the problematic accusations which are made about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about some of the conduct in wars or interpersonal relations, much of... So much of the literature comes from the Sira literature. Right? And uh, for example, uh, if you look at the debates on the blasphemy law in Muslim countries in Pakistan and other places where blasphemy laws are in place, you will find that all justification for blasphemy and for death for blasphemers comes from anecdotes from the Sira literature, neither from the Quran and the Hadith. So unfortunately, we did not, Muslim civilization did not anticipate that we will have to go back and historically defend the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But that does not mean that we cannot do serious scholarship now. So it is perhaps one way for Muslims to respond to contemporary Islamophobia is to really rev up, you know, to, 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 to do research in the life of Prophet Muhammad on steroids, we really need to go back and put a lot of effort. And uh, I'm very glad to say that at least in this tiny state of Delaware, in this month, uh, we have had at least two sessions where we have discussed the seerah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it is important that our young ones and our scholars and our members of the community learn about the life of Prophet Muhammad. A, to practice their faith more accurately, but B, also to engage in dialogues or at least provide uh, coherent and honest explanations of questions that are asked of our deen by others.